that comparative literature needs. Our rethinking of blurring of differences, our rethinking, I wish I could talk to you about how I teach English in my schools, but no time. Our rethinking of comparativism starts then with the admission that as language, languages are equivalent and that deep language learning must implode into a simulacrum of lingual memory. We must wait for this implosion which we sense after the fact, or perhaps others sense it in us, and we thus in, enter into a relationship with the language that is rather different from the position of a comparer, a charter of influence, who supposedly occupies a place above the linguistic traditions to be compared. When we rethink com comparativism, we think of translation as an active practice rather than a crutch, reading every damn thing in English and comparing. I have often said that translation is the most intimate act of reading. Thus, translation comes to inhabit the new politics of comparativism as reading itself in the broadest possible sense. My mother reminded me that English was a mother tongue. I went from that to understanding that all languages, when their mother tongues are first languages, are learned before reason. I thought comparative literature should try to access the impossible, this impossible limit over, quote, foreign language as it was learned before reason. A prayer to be haunted by its ghost. This is exactly the opposite of that meretricious theory of foreignization launched by a United States theorist, which reflects its politics, who doesn't even know about the great Arabic tradition of translation. When I told him, look, think about the Arabs, he said, yes, yes, I'm actually thinking of some Middle Eastern translators. <laughs> okay, so the, a prayer to be haunted by its ghost. This is, of course, also the task of translation. A prayer to be haunted by the original as first language. I believe my old friend Akbar Abbas has a theory that since post-colonials would otherwise read the text from the imperial language, which they would understand at best imperfectly, it is not illogical in the post-colonial situation to translate texts translated into the imperial language, then translate those texts into the local language from that imperial language translation rather than from the original. I think such theories accept the past of colonization not as changeful history, but as unchanging inevitability. We must not translate from English translations and thus forget the most important task of the translator toward the original, to be haunted by its ghost, to imagine it as first language, to be forgiven for the death of its phonic substance, allow its ghost to flourish. Do not tell me your university, not yours, but some people tell me, uh, do not tell me your university does not have language departments. Mine didn't either when I was a student there. In globality, there are one million ways of deep learning languages. If you don't have the money to do it at French and German institutes in your capital city, find it somewhere. I was doing five tuitions in order to be able to, I just thanked the French government when they gave me the Chevalier d'Honneur for being the first exit into cosmopolitanism at the, uh, at the uh, Alliance Française, 1960. Mine didn't either. In globality, there are one million ways of deep learning languages. I'm talking about the person who loves the text enough to want to translate it, not every student or reader. She or he goes toward the original, which is the only key to the social formations within the space where the texts were produced. Think again of the good development worker turning agency back to the subaltern. I quote, I will, I will not quote, but I have it here. I would have quoted, if time had not been climbing, Professor Claire Bourne's formula for the worker, development worker, confronted by an unwritten creole, since it is not true systematization or going to supposedly the main language of which this is a dialect, which is a wrong kind of understanding, bringing an, an extra African kind of understanding to this situation. Claire Bourne, who's a very wonderful applied linguist at EAU, she actually is working with us, and she has given us 
exactly some steps of what the good development worker can do in order to make the subaltern, so-called developed person, an agent of teaching the unwritten language, which we don't know how they are taught without literacy. So I, I have this thing and I'm, I'll be happy to share it with you, but I'm not going to read it. And then, when the development worker wishes to translate this original, because he or she is learning in this way, so that it would feed into a statistic. <coughs> These first steps are undone. Because the disciplinary formation of statisticians, even when they provide least corrupt statistics, is not one that can be amenable to the sort of autocritic that such a task of translation would require. And if you want to hear about the general run, run of development workers, that gives you another story. <clears throat> Invited by good middle-level global networking development leaders, I have attended many R&D, research and development, meetings all around the world, largely and mostly in Africa, hundreds. Whenever I encounter agricultural disciplinarians who work in the development field, basically providing good statistics, translating experience into statistics, into policy. I ask them, individual group by individual group, remember, without access to the real language of the, uh, those who are being developed, I, even if they're Africans. I ask them, uh, uh, do you get to the people for whom you're providing developmental statistics? Yes, they say, and I ask, how? We collect the data, train research assistants, send them out into the field to validate the data, and they come back to us, having touched the people we are developing. So, the data is pre-established and then validated. At this stage, I always ask if there are ever any surprises, and I always get the answer, no. Therefore, where social justice can be approached by giving agency back to the three continent subaltern, I just Ahmed's phrase, for the reverse racist um, words, Global South, three continents, Asia, Africa, Latin America. There is a barrier between that fragile workspace and the arena of the confident policymakers. I want to give you two examples, and don't be alarmed that I'm reading in such detail, because this is now the model that seduces young people. One is an email I received from, from Dr. Ravi Kumar, not personally known to me, last week. You must understand that I respect this colleague. History is larger than personal goodwill. I'm quite sure he's full of personal goodwill and does his job well. Does, just as the human development, I've spoken of this and some of you may have heard this, human development statisticians in the 2013 text said that there were two things that they were going to let go because they were hard to analyze. And they were the two that Mahubul Haq and Amartya Sen introduced in order to change development to human development life expectancy and, and schooling, but that's as it may be. So, they, I respect this guy. I simply think that the arena which seduces them do not allow them with the translation work of social justice that I have been trying hard to describe so far. Here is his email. He writes, I just returned from the sixth edition of the World Government Summit, Dubai, where I was hired as an interpreter for the summit. The summit was held in Dubai from February 11 to 13, 2018, where our Prime Minister Narendra Modi was invited as the guest of honor. This is an annual event conceptualized and hosted by the government of United Arab Emirates. I had, now comes name dropping, I had the opportunity to interpret for some of the top leaders of the world, such as Elwa Philippe, the Prime Minister of France, Professor Klaus Schwab, founder and chair of World Economic Forum, about whom I've written elsewhere, Davos. Anil Gurria, Security Secretary General OECD. Princess Haya bin Kalbusain, Chair of International Humanitarian City. Chrissy Naga, Managing Director of the IMF. Jim Yong King, President of World Bank. Richard West, CNN. Professor Micho Kaku, Physicist and Futurist. Bill McDermott, CEO, SAP. Deepak Chopra, Public Speaker and Prominent Figure of New Age Movement. Maurice Levy, CEO, Publicis. Dr. Tedros Adhanom, Director General, World Health Organization, Roberto Azevedo, Director General of World Trade Organization, Audrey Azule, he's interpreting for all of them, Director General of UNESCO, Quantity Over Quality. 
Director General of UNESCO, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Chairman of the Education and Human Resources Council, UAE. It is important to note that since its inception in 2013, he writes, this event has become one of the largest, that's its problem, largest events in the Arab world and has emerged as the common platform, common for who? For sharing knowledge with presence of representatives from government, futurism, technology, and innovation. It provides a platform for thought leadership. How is it possible to lead thoughts with this group of people? And it has, like a networking hub for policymakers, experts, and pioneers. Mind you, I'm an expert for the World, uh, world Economic Forum, expert in economic growth and social inclusion, and food security. So, in the Hub for Policymakers, experts and pioneers in human development, it also showcases innovations, best practices, and smart solutions to inspire creativity to tackle these future challenges. This year, the event hosted more than 4,000 delegates coming from 140 countries. The summit was held in partnership with the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, the UN, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development, the Dubai Mun Municipality, and El Centro Latin Americano, the Administración para el Desarrollo. Having the, oh, now here comes self-praise, having the opportunity to provide, this is very typical, it's, it's like the topos of how these things are described. Having the opportunity to provide interpretation service at such a platform was a unique experience in itself. Not just that I found myself amidst such eminent dignitaries of the world, it was also a challenge to perform my duties as an interpreter well. Since I regularly update myself on various subject matters, luckily my overall understanding of IT, artificial intelligence, data bank, politics, public policy, business, international commerce, UNO and its functions, law and current affairs, helped me position myself well during interpreting. Now, think of what I was saying about approaching gently the ones who are developed and giving the agency back to them. This does not lead to social justice. It's above a real. <coughs> I returned to, uh, this summit was yet another occasion to challenge myself and learn new things during the rendering process. I returned to New Delhi, my workplace, with a rich experience of what the future holds and what it is likely to look like. To, this is not something that one can really say. To educate the young into this digital saving of epistemological and, Im and imaginative labor is a kind of shrinking. The digital is a labor saving thing, but the one labor that must not be saved is intellectual and imaginative. This is why the digital should be used for what it's useful for, rather than come to take the place of thinking. To educate the young into this digital saving of epistemological and imaginative labor is a kind of shrinking. Listen to its description. Live interpretation or media interpretation is another upcoming concept in the field of interpretation. Those of us who have done this kind of thing for a very long time find this ridiculous. Professionally trained interpreters capable of delivering quality services will certainly find themselves getting an edge over others in this niche area. I feel fortunate, writes he, to have successfully conducted intensive live interpretation training for a selected few employees of Z Media, whom one shall see performing their duties as live interpreters on TV streams from next month. This will be the first time ever in the history of Indian media that live interpretation of news will be attempted Maud Lingua wishes good luck to this first generation of live media interpreters to lead the pack and lead the pack and scale heights, etc. Et Our best wishes to the first gener generation of media interpreters in India. Compare this <coughs> to the live interpretation undertaken by the interpreters in the Truth and Reconciling Commissions. It is not a new concept. In South Africa, Latin America, in the Balkans. Because they had to be translating immediately into the language of the aggressors, as they are translating the victims, and yet speak as if what was coming down in the immediate future 
of the translator's experience, what the victim was going to say next, <coughs> was part of the translator's lived past, because the translator was effacing herself, often women, and giving it as the victim's past. So to do such stressful, persuasive translation took so much out of them that they dried out after short periods of time. No resemblance at all to these young people being described above, who are leading the pack and capturing the niche, etc. This is live interpretation, not even like ours. And now here's one letter, one form letter to me, which once again shows how a temptation to meet award-winning people can take our focus away from the real task of translation. I'm going through these in such detail because ambitious young people from so-called, quote, developing countries get tempted by this and thus get habituated into being led away from working for thick social justice. Here's the letter, I'll read it fast. Dear Gaiti Chakraborty Spivak, it's a form letter, right, with my name inserted. On behalf of the hosts of the Steering Committee of Culture Summit 2018, Abu Dhabi, it is our pleasure to invite you to attend the summit as one of the featured participants in your capacity now, listen to this, as a thought leader and influencer in the worlds of culture, media, public policy. I wish public policy would listen to what I say. <laughs> for these people, public policy and international affairs. The event will take place in Abu Dhabi, etc., etc., is the world's first high-level summit that convenes leaders from the worlds of the arts, media, public policy, and technology to identify ways that culture can raise, remember what I said about culture, is a bogus word, that culture can raise awareness, build bridges, please hold on to this metaphor, build bridges and promote positive change. Last year's inaugural event was attended by 450 delegates from 80 countries, including internationally acclaimed visual artist Idris Khan, Academy Award-winning composer and conductor, Tandun, MacArthur Award-winning choreographer, Liz Lerman, and representatives, and so on and so forth. This year's program, unexpected collaborations, I should say, forging new connections between heritage, which is, of course, since the uh, Nara Declaration of 1994, is a huge business to which, in fact, we have contributed very happily. Heritage and innovation, near and far, creativity and purpose. Catechesis and telecommunications, which is fine. Near and far, creativity and purpose will focus on partnerships that are unique, different, and that blend tradition and innovation. Workshops, etc., etc., role of culture in improving our world. Newly opened Louvre, Abu Dhabi, with events and tours scheduled exclusively for participants, participants, etc. You can learn from it here and there. We invite you to join as a speaker in one or more of the sessions. We will be happy to work with you to find a role that will ensure your visit is worthwhile and rewarding. You know, I never give a TED talk. The kind of censorship, and I'm even told by some, by some art summits, you must not speak like an academic. What do you want, man? You want me, you want me, I'm an academic. You want me because you'll sell tickets, but you, I'm sorry to say that really boastful, uh, please forgive me, I'm talking about art summits. But you don't want me to talk like an academic, and then they'll start censoring. The one wonderful exception was the Vienna Festival, because they came up in 1951 to prove that all Austrians were not Nazis. They knew that academics should be allowed to speak like academics. There's a real difference. So, the, uh, so they're going to... Thank you. They, they, they are going to be happy to work with me so that we, they can ensure. We hope that you will be able to attend this unique event where you can share your insights in the fields of culture, technology, and public philosophy. Uh, public policy, sorry, horrible mistake. <laughs> Freud and Error. And public policy, to, et cetera, to RSVP, et cetera. I didn't read the whole thing at all. Okay, translation, I'm almost finished. Translation, as I said a bit ago, is the most intimate act of reading. If reading is understood as surrendering oneself into the other's space, the text space, as much as possible, it is also a preparation for the ethical reflexes to act if the call to the ethical interrupts the epistemological preparation for imaginative flexibility. The imagination in training 
flexing out, embraces the other in a critical intimacy, I said, which does not resemble the proclamation of interpretation that is the style of global capitalism. To end on a positive note, let me take you to Pramila Lohar's potato field, the last two slides. Last two slides. Let me take you to Pramila Lohar's potato, no, not the, the one before. The, this is not the potato field, the one before. Ah. Pramila Lohar's potato field, a veritable seminarium, seminarium, seedbed, for her whole group belonging to the people I work with in the extreme west of Birhum, is crazed now about old fertilizer, old seeds. If I could, I have told the story elsewhere about how the first thing was a total failure and how I'm not at all interested in being like many, many leaders of these movements, the top-down um, suggestions. They are now crazed, as crazed as I am. Nothing imposed by me, a counter-colonialism, not self-declared decolonization. Because our work is so different from large-scale development, here, constitutionality is once again indistinguishable from desire. And go to the next. There's a bit of land to cross before I get there, and a bit of water gathered. As I start to take off my sneakers, Suresh Roy, this guy, a co-worker, quickly builds a soft bridge, that's what he's doing, and I walk across. Let this effective bridge building be a parable for us. Of course we must learn to market our skills and make the best of our budgets. Racialized, colonized, gendered spaces should use digitized resources to access long withheld information. Not, however, mistaking the tool for the performance. But I also hope that you will continue to build soft bridges with language, only to be washed away and built again, rather than put together global access circuits that I described, that change the desire to flex the imagination toward the other into lucrative digital alternatives for global policies of sustainable underdevelopment. Shadows of Raymond Williams, English department, although he did think Wales was the periphery. Let me close with something I often quote, the only blog I ever wrote for the World Economic Forum. Normally, our desire is to do things ourselves or for ourselves. In good literary teaching, the student is taught carefully to hang out in the space of the other, understand what he or she confronts in terms of the unknown person, which is not really a person, who wrote what he or she confronts. This is the secret of the ethical and the democratic. One has to stay with it, not follow easy steps so that one can say, I have helped you. The long-term implementation, therefore, in addition to persuading CEOs and heads of state, calls for the teaching of the humanities at all levels and in all places so that the desire for social justice can inhabit souls long-term, not always susceptible to evaluation, by checking statistically how each item on a list is institutionally fulfilled. That's how we are evaluated these days. Now, I should say that the rich are more capable of idealism, so that when I talk to the people I work with, I don't talk idealistically. All this social justice stuff, it's possible to say it in local Bengali, so that the idea that one must also pursue money is not thrown away, but you folks, are really, you know, in the same kind of progressive bourgeoisie as I am. So therefore, I'm using an idealistic language of which we are capable. So, um, can inhabit souls long term, not always susceptible to evaluation by checking statistical tables. Um, huge and detailed country by country statistical tables are no doubt useful. But in terms of sustaining an improved world, we have to look at the fact that nations are not monolithic abstract averages, and that evaluations are remote fact-gathering which often do not reflect everyday reality. Here I said a word about religion which I must skip in the interest of time. We teachers of the humanities, literature and philosophy, at our best, train the imagination into knowing ourselves differently and knowing the world differently so that we want to work for social justice 
under sometimes very trying circumstances rather than have to be checked following enforcement. Today, the emphasis in education is acquiring digital speed. In order to be able to use the digital for social justice, the soul has to be trained slowly. And that is where literary training, as I have described it, comes into play. Recently, at the celebration of the Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe's life, the positive effect of his literary writings was repeatedly emphasized. With my experience of sustained work in Africa, I was obliged to say that below a certain class line, Nigerians had no idea who he was and what he wrote. And in fact, quite like the area where I teach here, when you go into the savannas where Nigerians are now trying to replant rice because of what happened with oil, the women with whom one speaks do not know the name Nigeria. I was just talking about Pochimongo, etc., to my class 